this morning. It's good to have you all here and hope everybody had a good week. Um, we'd uh, like to uh, mention we have a guest pastor. If you've seen in your bulletin, you know, Pastor Harrison, and um, so we welcome him this morning and uh, look forward to hearing God's word preached. So, um, so yeah, just welcome each and every one this morning. So let's all rise as we begin our worship service. they have their being by our God as well. As we will consider in his word today, proceed with great grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now sing number 242.
We come into the presence of our God. We come with praise. We come with thanks. But we also come humbly, recognizing that we are loved and redeemed by a holy God. And so, we come confessing our sins. And we're called to confess our sins in many places in Scripture, primarily in Exodus 20, the holy law of our God. Now, am I supposed to at this place say you may be seated? <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> or please be seated. Thanks. Exodus 20, I would like to read these familiar words. And as familiar as they are, there is nothing trivial. They still stand as the standard by which we understand God's will in summary form, as well as realize why Christ came into the world for our sins, for, the fail for our failure to keep these commandments. Christ died and redeemed us. Exodus 20, the verses 1 through 17, where we read, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to to your neighbor. Please join me in a prayer of confession today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for grateful hearts that you receive us. That as a father has compassion and delight in his children, so through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you are pleased to welcome us today. You are pleased to receive our worship, and we know that it is in Christ that we have, that our worship is sanctified. And so, you delight in our praises. But Lord, we are also humbled in your presence. We realize that you are a holy God. We again are reminded from the commandments that you that only the holy can stand in your presence. And so today, Father, as we confess our sins, Lord, we recognize that we are unable, that we are not worthy of standing in your presence or even of, to worship. But Lord, in Christ, Lord, as we confess our failings, we bank on your promises of forgiveness. We look to the cross of Jesus where each sin we 
are convicted by. Each one we know in our minds and in our hearts by grace through faith have been nailed on the cross. That our Savior bore our sin. And for that reason, Father, we thank you as we humbly again ask for forgiveness. And Lord, by your Spirit, using this same law, O oh, Father, sanctify us. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior. And that we would become more and more obedient to your will and to your laws. And that we would grow in holiness. We thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. A well-known passage, one of my favorites, is from the book of Micah. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. It reads as follows. This is in a prayer form where the prophet writes in prayer, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight, delight to show mercy. Our God is happy. He rejoices when his children come on bended knee, confessing their sins with sincere hearts, seeking forgiveness, clinging to the cross, where God was even delighted to sacrifice his son for you and for me. And so, as surely as we confess our sins, God is delighted. He is like a father who rejoices when his children come to be reconciled. Oh, what love our God has. And we realize it's not what our hands have done. But our, our Lord's voice today speaks of grace and mercy. Let's sing the words together, not what my hands have done.
Let's turn to our God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, that gift of prayer. Not only because of the privilege it is that we can bring all our concerns before your throne of grace, but you have ordained it. You even require it. And it also pleases you to bless our prayers. And Lord, as this community, we lift them up today. As we already have had the privilege of giving you thanks and praise, Lord, we pray that our worship would be sincere, but Lord, you would grant us worshipful hearts, not only during this hour, but each day. But Lord, we may be truly thankful that we may be truly aware of your awesome, not just goodness, but greatness. And that, Lord, we have been ordained as mere children to declare your praises. Whether it is in worship or prayer or in our confession, day to day in our interactions, Lord, you have called us to speak the truth in love, to, ha to have an answer to who, what we are and who we are in Christ. And so today, Father, we pray that you would fill each one of us here with the Holy Spirit in a powerful way as we move forward into a new week. And so that Christ may be praised through us. Now, Father, build up your church. Bless it. Add to it. Lord, we know that you are very sovereign in all that takes place. As we will be hearing from your word, we pray for your blessing upon it. Upon the word your servant speaks here and other servants in different pulpits throughout this area, throughout this world. May the gospel of grace and reconciliation go forth with power the Lord increase your church and Father may, your, may our light shine in a day of darkness in a world hostile to Christ Lord may what we say and do point the way and whether accepted or rejected Lord we know that in it all you are glorified. But Lord, of course, it is our desire that others be one for Christ. And so make our lives a beacon to that end. Lord, today we, we want to pray for needed rain throughout this region. We're thankful, Father, that areas have received it, but there are more, there is more needed. Lord, grant our crops what they need to grow so that we may feed the world. Lord, bless the hard work of our farmers, of those who labor in a variety of areas related to farming or in other ways. Bless our tasks and help us to remember who our real, who the real foreman, the real boss, as it were, that we are working unto the Lord in all that we do. We pray for families. We pray for the elderly. We pray for our children. Lord, we lift them up all before your throne of grace. In the various stages of our lives, Lord, help us to early learn, to early remember our Creator. Lord, may Christ's words fill all our ears from early on as he bids us to come to him. 
where we find someone gentle, someone who truly loves us and receives us and willingly lays down for us as a good shepherd for his sheep. And so, Lord, bless. Bless the families of this church. Lord, too, do we want to pray and give you thanks for the work of Pastor Dan. We thank you, Father, for your servants who labor among us. And we're thankful for a season of, of travel and rest and relaxation for Dan and his family. Lord, we pray for safety in their travels, as well as in all who are traveling in this summertime, finding opportunities for rest and recreation. And Lord, we're thankful for the summertime and the opportunities it provides. And Lord, help us to truly be thankful for the seasons. As we look into the field, help us to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the crops. And so, Lord, truly give us grateful hearts to say thank you each day. I want to pray, for Lord, too, for the sick and the suffering among us. I want to pray today, Lord, for, for Patty Fern. We're thankful that she could come home after a long stay and that she is at home recovering. Oh, Father, give her full healing. For Ethan Fick, Ruth Ann's grandson, oh, Father in heaven, we pray for healing for healing for his body. For Scott Koenga, Lord, we know it has been a very difficult time for him, for pancreatic cancer. Lord, we seek your grace for the shrinking of that tumor so that the doctors would be able to remove it. Lord, continue to encourage and comfort Nancy Van Someren. Lord, as she receives hospice care, we're thankful for the comfort, for the encouragement provided. And Father, especially bless her faith, bless her confidence in a glorious future. And so, Lord, be with all who are sick. Be with all who are struggling in ways not mentioned today, but you know. And so we cast all our cares before you because you care for us. We pray also your blessing on the offering for Jim's. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading for the message this morning comes from the book of Job. The book of Job is just before the book of Psalms. The book of Job is a most fascinating part of the scriptures and wisdom literature. And we need to pray for the wisdom that God would grant upon it. I'm just going to read chapter 1 this morning. But the text, or the text will be just two verses, verses 21 and 22. I ask you to join me as we pray for God's word this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, your word is a light upon our path, a lamp for our feet. And Lord, by it we are instructed. By it we are equipped for every good work. Especially as your gospel message draws us to you. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts. Open the mouth of your servant to speak your words. And Lord, may I be faithful. And may your other servants today who are doing likewise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Job chapter 1. In the land of Uz, there was a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. 
And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified purified. Early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has in, is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and one day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed their three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job chapter 1, again, text is final two verses. Congregation of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I wrote this sermon, when I worked on it four years ago, it was in the month of August. And in my research, I read the newspapers and online looked at stories of great suffering that was taking place, disasters. There were 20 people murdered in El Paso, Texas on August 3, 2019. And I remember seeing a picture of a 63-year-old man weeping at a memorial for his wife. Yes, indeed, mass murders. Earthquakes, tidal waves, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, pandemics and all sorts of natural disasters kill millions 
throughout the world. At one time during his earthly ministry, Jesus himself asked his disciples if they thought that the many Galilean protesters who were unjustly murdered by Roman soldiers were worse sinners than other people. That was the question he asked. Do you think that they were worse sinners because they were killed? On another occasion, recorded in John 9, the disciples asked Jesus if a man they encountered who was born blind as a result was as a result of his parents or his own sin. And there Jesus would give the true answer. We read Job and we ask the question, why? Not only why did these things have to happen to Job, but why did God not just permit them? But in order to prove a point, ordain it, allow the devil to afflict Job with these great catastrophes and losses, not just to his, not just to his farm, or I mean his uh, property, his animals, but his own children. And we ask that same question when we go through calamity or through hardship. I have to admit, I just got these glasses and I'm not overly pleased at the moment. But I think I'll be all right. (laughs) I remove them for now. But it has often been a wrong adage held by many that People who suffer, especially God's children, who suffer more than others, must be doing something wrong. Or we'll even say that or think that ourselves when we go through many trials and severe griefs. Thinking, Lord, what am I guilty of? What? Why do you allow it? What what do I am doing wrong? After all, do you not promise long life, relative health, and good fortune? As part of your favor, aren't they signs of God's favor when people do well? So the withholding of these blessings must mean less favor. And as I said, it was not unique in Jesus' time, but already some 4,000 years earlier, roughly, or excuse me, 2,000 years earlier, 4,000 years ago now, the patriarch Job, going through these tragedies, not only proved himself to remain blameless and upright, but also was accused, would be accused by comforters, friends, of having committed some great sin, or of being a great sinner in some way secretly. And all the while, Job would insist that such was not the case. But Jesus would correct, Jesus himself would correct, as well as God, in Job, but Jesus himself in his ministry would point out two things about suffering. One of them is that it is the work of God might be displayed. The Bible teaches that the righteous may have many afflictions, but the Lord delivers them of them all. That's the point. That is what we will see here with Job. When we see those who suffer great calamity in their lives, 
trusting in God, walking through the valley of even the shadow of death to the best of their ability, accepting the guidance and comfort of God as they walk through it. That is the work of God displayed. And in his sovereign, mysterious providence in each of our lives, God calls us to a variety of sufferings. Some more, some less. Even in the Bible it says it has been granted to you to suffer. With Christ. Anyway, the, the church glorifies God, glorifies God is the key. That's what God was saying and what God was permitting and showing that he will be praised by Job through his sufferings. The same way that the suffering of our Savior on the cross not just saves us from our sins, but it gives glory to God. God is glorified in the death of his Son. And is held up. And thankfully, and with praise, he is glorified when sinners repent and put their trust in Christ. But Job is not a great sinner, as his friends were accusing him, or had committed a great sin. But indeed, he is blameless and upright. And even his words there in the text, verses 21 through 22, he, he shows his great fear, respect, trust, and acceptance of God's providence. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Beginning with the words, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. We're going to look at the wisdom of Job, first of all. And then the faith of Job. As we, as we see in Job the wisdom that God grants to those who ask, as well as the faith that we must have in the face of our suffering. First, the wisdom. Yes, indeed, these friends, if we kept on reading into chapter 2, we would see more calamity come upon Job, where God would permit Satan to afflict Job's body with great sores, with great pain. And then to add insult to injury, we would say, Job's friends show up trying to help him but again, wrongly accuse him. Now, out of fairness to Job's three friends that would come and accuse him in their effort to help him now, they did not know what was going behind the, on behind the scenes, obviously. They did not know what we know. They did not see the conversation between Satan and God and so they did not know what we know already. So we need to be careful that we don't quickly look at Job's friends and go, oh. because we've got to ask ourselves, how, what wisdom do we have? Not just for our own sufferings, but when we see our neighbor suffer. When we see others go through, not just once in a while, but some people seem to have every calamity or certainly a great deal of it in their lives. And so what do we think? One of the things that we got to understand about Job's words there is that he is not acting in denial. He is not just saying, oh well, I came naked from my mother's womb and Naked I will return, or depart. 
kind of interesting in the original Hebrew. He's saying, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. There's an expression of that time. Of course, he meaning when he returns to the dust of the ground. Job is not being... He's not acquiescing in a dismissive, cynical sense of, well, Lord. And as much as his friends think otherwise, Job is truly praising God because it is his wisdom to go, well, I should say it's his faith too, but he has the wisdom to right away seek out the giver and taker of life. He goes to his God. He remembers what he knows. In my life, I shared a little bit with the council this morning. I've, I'm a widower. My wife passed away last year. She passed away two months after my mother passed away. My wife and I, we had two children pass away many, many years ago as infants. We had plenty of sufferings. And, and I don't want to draw too much attention to what I and my wife had gone through, but other than to say we knew right away, especially when we lost those children, of other people our own age who had children either born with severe defects that died young, one, a friend of ours, whose child died in a bus, bus accident, another one whose mother gave birth to two boys. Twice she had it. Not, not twins, but twice until they figured it out. She could not have a child that would survive outside the womb. And we went through all these things. And we realized when Deb and I went through it, my wife's name was Deborah, when we went through it, the first thing we realized, as much of a shock and heart-wrenching of reality, right away we thought of some of these friends. And I remember thinking, well, if we could say to these friends, the Lord is going to help you through this, trusting God, whatever the reason, then we have to do likewise. And Job had already that wisdom, and again, I'm, I'm not doing it to, to praise our wisdom, that's not the point, but thankfully, God did show us that the place to go with, to go, is to the Lord. Wisdom says, don't run away from the Lord in the midst of grief or great trial or great loss, but go to him. That was where Job was wise. He's not being in denial, even when he says, may the name of the Lord be praised. He may not have felt it in his heart, but he did say it's true nevertheless. Wisdom says, somehow, even though I don't understand it, there's no easy answer. In fact, some people read Job and they, they can't understand that God would allow such a thing. As if God is playing a game here. Well, the thing that we have to remember this is where wisdom again. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We live in a world under curse. And even though Christ has redeemed us from the curse, these bodies we live in are subject, nevertheless, to death and decay. All die. And that death is not just, well, after a long life and all kinds of happiness and rosy success. I can finally go to my resting place and have my place in heaven. No. 
we find out rather quickly, especially in the Church of Jesus Christ, as we bear with each other's sorrows, that people of all ages will have a variety of very serious and tragic things happen. And to ask for that enough wisdom to say, even though I don't understand, I can still say, whatever happens, that the name of the Lord is to be praised. Somehow. And that's what that's what Job meant. In fact, if you read on, you will not see Job practicing this self, this or he will not be practicing some kind of pushing away how he feels. He will, not, he will do plenty of complaining. And he'll get plenty upset with his friends. And yes, he even overdoes his sense of innocence. A little bit. But he also shows his wisdom in response after the, after the terrible and painful skin disease that he receives, chapter 2, which I did not read. His wife says in verse 9, Job's own wife says, are you still holding on to your integrity? Are you still grasping with your whole heart your love for God after all that's happened to us, to you? She says, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And even here in wisdom, Job says in verse 10 of chapter 2, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Again, wisdom, perspective. Accepting the trouble from God. Job is doing that in those verses. Not because he's denying anything, but because he knows his God. He knows enough to trust God regardless. That's wisdom. That's why one of my favorite texts is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where we read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You get that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And that's in the midst of suffering. That's in the midst of your experience. Lean not, which is our tendency, on your own understanding. Well, obviously it must mean in our minds. And God gave us minds to understand many things. But with Job we see that it's very limited. But trusting in the Lord with all our hearts, while not leaning on our own understanding, in all our ways, it says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Again, that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That, in my experience, and in my wife's experience, my late wife's experience, is true. He, ha he has and is making our paths straight. Hers is now that she's with the Lord. You see, Job knew the greatness, the sovereignty, and the wisdom of God, which told him in his great grief and pain is that I do not have the right nor the ability or sense to match God so that I can decide what God should do or shouldn't. And again, these are things to think about when you're at the funeral parlor. When you come to give comfort, you seek 
not only for yourself, but for the person suffering. You may not have to, you may not be the one to tell them, but you pray at least that God would help everyone understand that God is sovereign, that God knows better, and that God is even working these things together. God works these things together for our good and for our salvation. And we must also recognize that even though God does punish the wicked in this life and in the next, that all the miseries are, are part of the curse upon the world, we should not see that as God's direct punishment upon us. Instead, God allows us it to become a, a place of refinement where God directs our lives and he is working all things together for our good. And as we see with Job, even the holiest can suffer many great things in this world. And we need to pray for wisdom. In fact, we are told in James chapter 1, 2 through 5, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy, even though you don't feel it. But there is a reason you can consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, James goes on to say, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to him or her. We need to pray for wisdom, folks. Especially as we go through the trials and hardships of our lives. Because we want our lives to be praiseworthy to God. We want God to be able to exhibit his power through us, as we through our various trials. And we need to pray for the wisdom to understand it, to have the proper perspective. And then briefly, the faith of the church, personified in Job now, we're talking about Job's faith. Again, his wife told him to curse God and die. But Job's trust in God included that he would not he would not turn on his God. Somehow somehow God's love for me continues. I walk by faith, not by sight. I say, well, God loves me because of what I see. But God loves you when you don't see it. That's faith. Things hoped for, unseen things, promises. No, I, I trust in him so much that I accept his providence, as tough as it can be sometimes. See, Satan figured that Job would turn on his faith. He would lose his faith. Take away, take away all his possessions. Take away all those blessings. Take away the, his health. And he'll curse your face. Talk about the audacity for that vile offender, Satan, in, in the face of a holy God to talk that way. No, jo Job had enough wisdom and enough faith that 1 Peter 1 verse 6 would describe it this way. In this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have, to, have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. 
1 Peter 1, verse 7 gives a reason. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. In the face of the hardships, in the face of great grief, at the funeral parlor, at home, feeling the loneliness that our widows and widowers experience. We need to pray for that kind of faith as well. That it would be, and say, Lord, as I go through this fire, give me the wisdom as well as the faith that I would put it in perspective. Because I want a faith that is... Re- that will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, Job had that faith. Job would not charge God with wrongdoing. He never did. In fact, Job figured God would be on his side in the argument. But even Job had to repent. When God finally speaks out of the whirlwind in chapter 38, when God says, quote, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, I will question you, and you shall answer me. You see, part of Job's misunderstanding was he thought that God owed him an explanation. But then notice how Job, despite his great suffering, despite God's rebuke of him and his friends, Job repents. Talk about a faith. In chapter 42, verse 3, Job says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. And then in verse 6, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And he does so because he wants his wisdom and he wants his faith to be pure. He wants God to be glorified. He wants our lack of understanding uh, to be pure. To be that which leads us to a greater glory for God and trust in Him. I'm going to close. One of the things that I have often found fascinating and something that we overlook, and certainly I did for many, many years reading the book of Job, I, I thought of his children throwing parties and the house falling in on them. I thought, how tragic, you know, what about those kids? What about those kids? Especially as a parent who has lost a couple of children, one to accident and one to a, a heart defect. Notice what Job would do. He would purify his children after their parties. How he did that? probably some ceremonial thing. And then he would make a sacrifice for them in case they had cursed God in their hearts. What do those sacrifices point to? They point to a promise that I know my wife and I held very dear. And that is Christ died for believers and their children. Remember those sacrifices that Job brought point to the cross of Jesus for his children. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we seek to understand things that 
may be too wonderful for us. Lord, grant us enough understanding that we would grow in wisdom, that we, our faith would be strengthened and all the more purified, even though we can As we encourage one another, grant us the wisdom and the faith to walk side by side, always trusting in our God, who loves us in his Son, and whose name we pray, amen. This time the offering will be received. The offering today will be for the Jim's Girls Club. I think it's for the, not locally, but for their, the CRC's, uh, you know, the national office or whatever it is. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's all rise as we sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
receive the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.